Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Young Turks book launch. Please welcome the producer of Young Turks and your host for the evening, Shruti Mishra. Good evening ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Young Turks book launch. For 13 years, Young Turks has been supporting India's entrepreneurial ecosystem by bringing audiences the hottest startup stories. We are proud to launch the first Young Turks book profiling stories of 13 of India's youngest, brightest tech entrepreneurs and for that would like to first invite on stage co-author Saina Denugara. Okay, uh, good evening and a very warm welcome to everyone to the Young Turks Conclave that marks uh, also the launch of the first Young Turks book. So we embarked on the journey of putting this book together in January 2014 and the idea was simply to profile stories of first generation entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs who had created businesses that had become a niche within the sector or businesses that uh, were disruptive and innovative in ways that we hadn't seen before. So we looked at the 1700 over 1700 entrepreneurs that we featured on Young Turks and we thought we'll do it across sectors but then when we started closely analyzing all of that we realized that some of the most interesting compelling stories actually came from the tech space uh, and the tech space actually is quite amorphous it's you know evolving every day uh, every six months i think there's a new definition of what tech stands for so we have we drew up a list of around 17 young uh, startups that list of 17 providentially came down to 13 which worked very well because young turks was in the 13th year and we thought this was just perfect and let's stick with this bunch of 13 so i want to take this opportunity to thank all the 13 startup teams that we featured for their time for their patience for multiple rounds of interviews and clarifications and all of that and for also being extremely candid uh sharing their stories the good the bad and the ugly and i think all of that has come together in a book that uh, hopefully will be an enjoyable read an educative read and uh, yeah thanks a lot thanks for joining us in this uh, uh, evening and hope we have a very compelling evening where all 13 of you again share very interesting stories with us i want to invite shireen on stage now she's the force behind the book and behind the show for the last 13 years and let's have a round of applause for her. thank you saina for being the backbone of this project for being a pillar of strength thank you for your patience your calming energy and your softness this book would not have been possible without you this book would also not have been possible if i had not come to terms with my fears over the last 6 to 7 years several publishers have reached out to me asking me to do a book but i could never get myself to say yes because i thought why would anyone want to read my book i don't have anything new to say i don't have anything path breaking or insightful to say i don't even have a compelling story to tell i felt unsure and uncertain because after all i'm just a journalist so what do i know about running a business so when random house approached me last year i felt the same but then that sensation took me back 15 years to exactly the day that i joined cnbc tv 18 i felt the same fear when i walked into cnbc tv 18 15 years ago as a rookie producer there were numbers flying at me every second profit loss capex opex ebitda and the list just went on and on and on and i remember calling my first boss karan thapar in the first week of being in my new role as an anchor producer at cnbc tv 18 and telling karan that i think i've made a big mistake and he told me don't worry you can always come back but then as they say on the bumper sticker you've only got three choices in life give up give in or give it all you've got so i worked 15 hours every day to find my feet and my voice and once i got over my fears and stopped being intimidated by the material i realized that profit and loss is just a number 
it's really a result of the choices that a CEO makes and that sparked my interest in understanding why some companies succeed and some fail. So this book is our attempt at understanding the choices made by 13 brave men and their choices reflect their hopes and not their fears. Finally, I found not one but 13 compelling stories to tell, stories that give us hope and confidence and these entrepreneurs are living proof that we are not prisoners of our circumstances. Tracking the stories of successful business leaders for the last 15 years has taught me that understanding your vulnerabilities is as important as understanding your strengths because that will help you define your position, give you your uniqueness, make you special. Success lies not just in managing tangible results, but in understanding the causes. Mother Teresa said, some people come into our lives as a blessing, some come into your life as lessons, and I have many people to thank for the wonderful lessons that they've taught me. Mr. N. R. Narayanamurthy, he's here with us this evening, ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause to him. Thank you very much, sir. I will always be grateful to you for teaching me the most important lesson. Entrepreneurship must not be about personal gratification. It must be about delayed gratification. You always told me true success must be measured on the index of respectability and not on the Forbes rich list. For that, I thank you for your time, your attention that you've given me for over a decade. Many thanks to my mentor, Senthil Chengalvarayan, for teaching me that a leader must be selfless, approachable, accessible, and caring. I cannot thank you enough for all the support and guidance over the last 15 years. A big thank you to my team for being fearless and passionate. Thank you to Anil Onyal, who's more a friend than a CEO. My many thanks to Shilpi Singh, my wonderful partner in many crimes. My many, many thanks to my friends. There's so many of you in this room today. Uh, all of you sitting on table number eight. So thank you very much for giving me your hearts, your shoulders, and I stand taller today because of you. Thank you very much for my parents for giving me the greatest gift, the freedom to be myself without the fear of being left alone. Someone I respect deeply told me that you can stand tall if you're always trying to fit in. So thank you all for your wisdom, your love, and your support. And let me end by saying, Picasso said, the meaning of life is to find your gift and the purpose of life is to give it away. So here's wishing you all the very best of luck. We hope you continue to find magic in everything that you do. Thank you very much for being here this evening. May I request Mr. Murthy to please join us in stage and do the honors. May I request Saina to please his back as well. A few words. Welcome. First of all, uh, let me say it has been a great pleasure to be here today to participate in the book release of uh, one of India's finest. Uh, business anchors and of course a colleague while I have known Shireen for the last 15 years I haven't had the privilege of meeting Saina whom I met just today I also thank every one of the entrepreneurs that have been uh, interviewed in the book we also have my good friend uh, Saurabh here, one of the earliest entrepreneurs of modern India. I must say for the first time in the history of Indian television, Shireen has created through her wonderful program of Eng Turks an opportunity for budding entrepreneurs and in many cases, well, 
proven entrepreneurs to talk about their journey, their passion, their dilemmas, their daring, and their sacrifices, so that the youngsters of this country can indeed learn from the from the experience of these wonderful role models, and indeed do even better. For a very simple reason, and that is, I am quite convinced that the only way that we in India can solve the problem of poverty is through creation of more and more and more jobs with higher and higher disposable incomes, as the economists say. And by creating more and more wealth, and consequently paying more and more taxes so that the country can use those taxes to make life better for the poor in terms of education, healthcare, nutrition and shelter as well as creating infrastructure for us to accelerate our economic growth. There is no other way that societies can solve the problem of poverty it's time that our politicians and our bureaucrats understood that and made life easier for our entrepreneurs. Now, every one of these entrepreneurs are truly extraordinary people. If I were to borrow the words of late Robert Kennedy, who himself borrowed it from George Bernard Shaw to define leadership, and then use it in this context, and that is, he said, most people see things as they are and wonder why. I dream of things that are not there and then say, why not? I think in essence, this sums up what entrepreneurship is all about. These are people who dream of things that are not around them and then say, why not? Their journey is daring, they are very courageous, they make huge sacrifices, and they believe in deferred gratification, etc., etc. So every one of these 13 entrepreneurs that have been listed in the book are clearly smarter than I am, they are brighter than I am, they have achieved at their age what I did not, therefore, I can hardly give any advice to them. I read the book. I am truly amazed. I know the landscape of entrepreneurship is healthy in India. I know these guys are going to achieve a lot more than we could have imagined, a lot more than what we have achieved. So let me say a few things about my own experience of the journey of entrepreneurship. First, as Peter Thiel, the famous entrepreneur, said, entrepreneurs should all try to create enterprises that take zero and make it one. What he meant by that was, think of new ideas, think of discontinuity like whether it's a Google or a Microsoft or an, you know, or a Tesla, Elon Musk or, or SpaceX, etc. Of course, most of us try to go from one to n. In other words, we look at ideas that already exist and make it more than one. As he very rightly pointed out, if you want to be the next Larry Page, it is very unlikely that you will succeed, as much as they did. If you want to be the next Bill Gates, it's not very likely that you will have a market cap more than $410 billion that his company has today. However, if you think of something that Bill Gates of the world and Larry Pages of the world or uh, Mark Zuckerbergs of the world did not think, then you have a chance of creating India's first company with a trillion dollar market cap. 
and for that you have to go to what i term extreme differentiation the good thing with such extreme differentiation is you will become a monopoly for a reasonable period the good thing about being a monopoly is that you have time to think of new innovations you have time to think of things other than just making sure that you have revenue growth for this quarter and your profitability for this quarter therefore the first principle is differentiation second i would say that scaling up is extremely important it's not sufficient to be a 1000 crore company you have to aspire to become a 100000 crore company and if you want to be a 100000 crore company if you want to be a 1 million crore company then you have to learn to recruit the right people you have to put in systems so that the so that your company will not fall apart when you scale up and that will also give you the mental and physical energy to run this marathon we all know that there are some people who can learn who can run 5 kilometers some people who can run 10 kilometers some people can run the entire marathon and the and it happens simply because of the mental energy that these people who run the uh, full marathon have so therefore prepare yourselves for running the full marathon second if i were to be asked what is the most important objective most important objective for any corp corporation i would say it is respect there is nothing more important for a human being than respect when mahatma gandhi was assassinated he had no public position he was not the prime minister he was not the governor general he was he was really he was a freedom fighter he was the leader amongst the freedom fighters but the presidents and the prime ministers of various countries came when infosys had a revenue of just 129 million dollars we were voted ahead of so many of our much larger competitors as the most respected company the best managed company and the reason was very simple because we went after respect second i would say that if you want to go public realize that that comes with many advantages but at the same time it also comes with tremendous responsibilities quarter after quarter after quarter you have to show growth otherwise shirin will badger you shirin will grill you of course he also has that extraordinary empathy and when she realized that you are a little bit weak she has that daughterly affection to say a few good comments and help you come out of it but the reality is simply this that it is their job to grill you it is the job of the investors to be dissatisfied with you it is the, your employees will get dissatisfied the customers will get dissatisfied therefore if you are prepared to run this long marathon quarter after quarter after quarter you have to show revenue growth you have to show profit growth that's the only way this game is played so please remember that going public is not just all plus there is huge responsibility parallelly remember that fairness transparency and accountability will have to become your mantra if you want to succeed as a listed company because without these three precepts without these three attributes 
I don't think you will be able to run your marathon as a listed company. With investors, we realized pretty early in 1993 that under-promise and over-deliver is always a safe thing because life is all about expectations. If the reality is less than expectation, no matter how high that reality is, people will be disappointed. On the other hand, if the reality is higher than expectations, no matter how low that expectation, how low that reality is, as long as it is higher than, higher than your ex the expectations of the analysts, the TV anchors, and of course investors, then they are happy and you are happy. Values are extremely important in your journey as an entrepreneur because Values are all about earning respect. And as I told you, respect transcends both power and wealth. Respect is the only thing that will outshine both power and wealth. Therefore, my request to every one of you who have already come to a fairly good level in your journey is to keep respect as your talisman and in everything that you do, everything that you do, just ask a question. Is this action of mine going to enhance respect for my company? That is extremely important. Openness to new ideas, meritocracy, an environment of fairness, transparency, accountability and justice, speed, Imagination or innovation and excellence in execution are the only context invariant and time invariant attributes for the sustained success of a corporation. But remember that the only way that your, your corporation can indeed be a long term player is by living in harmony with the society. Because society contributes customers, society contributes employees, society contributes investors, society elects politicians, and society provides bureaucrats. Therefore, if you want to grow better and better and better, if you want to make life better for your people, if you want to help your customers become better and better and better, if you want your investors to get better returns, there's only one tap, and that is earn the respect of the society, live in harmony with the society. Folks, I can go on and on and on. I think you people know much more than I do. You people are much smarter than I am. The 13 people that have been listed have achieved a lot more than I could have achieved at that age. Remember, my entrepreneurship journey started when I was 34 years and 11 months. I had this mortal fear that if I didn't do something before I was 35, I wouldn't succeed. Because I had read somewhere in one of the articles that most people who start entrepreneurial journeys after 35 are not likely to succeed. Now, so therefore, I, I made sure that I started before 35. But in the case of almost all of you, I don't think that's a worry. You have already come to a pretty good level. You have a great future ahead of you. This country expects you to lead the economic growth. This, the, the, the people of this country expect you to create jobs for their children, brothers, sisters, etc., etc. And therefore, you have a great sense of responsibility in creating India of the 2020, India of the 2030. And I have no doubt at all that every one of you will do an outstanding job in this task and we will cheer you on the sidelines, we will applaud you, but you are running that marathon. You are the one who is 
physically tired but it is that mental energy that will give you to take the next step because your legs say no 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 i'm going to stop but your mind says i'm going to take the next step and i have no doubt at all that you have this mental energy because india expects you and i don't think this country will solve the problem of poverty without you people thank you very much thank you very much mr murthy Ladies and gentlemen it's now time to call on our first panel as an early investor in Inmobi and InfoH two of India's billion dollar technology unicorns Sandeep Murthy has been one of the builders of India's internet economy and he hasn't just seen the highs and lows play out as an investor but has actually roughed it out in the operational roles including one as the CEO of ClearTrip in 2006 for 2 years Today he is a partner at Lightbox a new venture capital fund he co-founded earlier this year Ladies and gentlemen please welcome the moderator of our first session Sandeep Murthy Joining Sandeep on stage is the co-founder of a company that sold discount coupons first offline and then offline and then made the transition to building a marketplace based e-commerce company since then there has been no looking back please welcome rohit bansal of snapdeal.com Our next venture has positioned itself as the go-to company in the mobile advertising space. After an agonizing birth, InMobi today has become the world's second largest mobile ad network after Google. Co-founded by four friends from IIT, Navin Tiwari, Amit Gupta, Abhay Singhal and Mohit Saxena back in 2007 as MCoach, a deals platform on the mobile, the venture rebranded itself to InMobi in 2009. The idea was simply to create a product that would sit between the advertiser and consumer and deliver well-targeted mobile ads. Today, InMobi services customers in 165 countries and has raised $216 million from heavyweight investors like Silicon Valley-based Ram Shriram and Japan SoftBank. The last fund raised of $200 million from SoftBank in 2011 valued the ad network at close to a billion dollars. Please welcome on stage Abhay Singhal of InMobi. Sandeep, over to you. Great. Yeah. So, uh, quite, quite the panel here. We've got two billion dollar businesses and I'm, I'm glad to say at least I got into one. So, as far as venture goes, the 50% hit rate is uh, considered pretty good. So, <laughs> I'm 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 glad to see uh, both of you here and I'm I'm quite amazed at the success. I mean, I've had the fortune of knowing both the businesses right from the beginning and uh and Rohit, I've spent a lot of time with Kunal over the years and um and and the reality is you guys have been through so much change and 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 in reading the chapter in the book as well, it was a lot about pivot as uh, as you talked about it. But when you look at the the evolution of the business, it actually was a very clear set of logical progressions over the years. And so it wasn't as much that we were doing this and then suddenly we changed our mind over here. So so can you talk a little bit about that and how whether you saw it as really radical changes or actually logical progressions and and maybe a little on what the next logical progression might look like. Sure sure uh, you know uh, it's it's very interesting that both of our businesses uh, started their life with coupons and deals. <laughs> and one became a mobile ad network and another became a became a marketplace uh, but you're right you know in in hindsight all these all these seem almost like almost like planned events as if they were meant to be but you know when we look back and see what we were doing 7 years 8 years back uh, as a physical coupon booklet company we couldn't have imagined that we would be running a marketplace 8 uh, years 8 years later you know to really to really i think summarize summarize what happened and how we went through these logical transitions in our business there's there's still that one day uh, i remember uh, you know both both myself and kunal uh, both of us have known each other since high school so we started our business end of 2007 uh, with a physical coupon booklet called money saver 
and our idea was that you know there are so many retail businesses coming up in the country uh, people would need a way to drive consumers to their stores which is more than just brand advertising so we started you know we were 23 years old so we were pretty naive as well so we thought this is a, this is the next billion dollar idea and let's start this uh, i remember we started our business september 2007 uh and both of us were extremely fascinated with the idea that we had in our mind that this is this is the next product that's going to blow the country away we spent about 10 months to launch the first product we just wanted to get it right you know from the printing of the printing of the booklet to the color scheme to the logo to the kind of offers we get etc 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 it took us 10 months to launch and we were so so excited about the launch uh we said you know we are pretty confident the day we launch uh we'll sell out all the booklets that we print so to make sure we don't run out we printed 50000 copies of the first edition so uh and you know when when we put up the first first set of stalls uh in june june 2008 which is about 10 months after we started uh to sell the booklets uh i we convinced a few companies uh, to allow us to set up stalls at their their offices uh over the first 10 days of launch we would have ourselves uh met about 10 to 15000 people to try and sell this concept to them and in 10 days we sold four copies <laughs> so that was a pretty humbling moment uh, for both of us and a, and a sudden shock into realization that not everything that we plan will go as planned and it's extremely important for us to go out there into the market fast uh, and get real consumer feedback and listen to our environment and then plan what we want to do rather than cook up stories in our own minds and you know we we had seen the result of what what that created uh, in 10 months so as a result over a period of time we just very rapidly launched something into the market learnt what the how the market was reacting to it what our consumers were saying and kept progressing and that's what took us to our present business actually you bring up a, a great point listening to the market and and hearing that feedback so So I know a lot about the the early days of our journey at Inmobi and so maybe you talk a little bit about that that uh, early realization of moving from a, an India business to to a, a global business and what that meant and how we how how the company dealt with it and today as such a young company to have become so global you were telling me recently now you've taken on the role of HR which is a big testament to how important um the company considers that function now in in the business and and the importance you're placing on managing that for the growth how 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 are you handling being global this early and and where's that going so so one thing uh, it's the same book that uh, mr murthy was also saying uh, peter thiel book 0 to 1 that book says uh, what is one thing that you know which is true but others don't believe in it uh and i think that question is a pretty pretty interesting question i think back even in 2010 uh, or even 2009 we believe that mobile is global and it was a pretty gutsy move with only 8 million in the bank that you guys gave us uh thinking about conquering the world was absolutely not possible so clearly taking that move and hiring that first person who we paid the salary which was collectively put together higher than every other employee in inmobi was a pretty uh, gutsy decision but then again uh Uh, to do a zero to one you need to believe in uh, some of those things that only you know are true uh, and others will probably catch up to it uh, so i think yeah no i global has been uh, our mantra from day one we right now have about 18 offices across the world as one of my other employees says sun never sets in mobi empire i never believed in that but for some reason we always end up having calls in weird hours uh to support that business so no that's that's interesting yeah. so actually in, in that in that same vein when you when you think about the global competition um you know we were talking a little earlier about google and facebook even in the the clip at the beginning were mentioned as the companies out there the companies in the space every day the team has to wake up and fight two 800 pound gorillas how do you how do you keep energized and, and roads you're, you're smiling over there but the same question is coming to you in a second and you know how do you keep a team energized against uh, such such uh, such big big competition so uh 
in a fight between a crocodile and an elephant the only way crocodile can win is when he brings the elephant to the water if he if uh, if he goes on the land then he surely is going to die so we can't beat uh, google or facebook by being google or facebook you need to come up with our own game and and hope that we succeed in that game uh, and as as you know it's a delayed gratification so clearly we positioned ourselves very well uh with the only company which is a non own and operated space which is in that list of top 10 mobile providers across the world uh uh and that's that's an incredible feat in itself but from here to go to the next level you need to find a game that the other players are actually not capable of playing or are not able to see um uh, and we've launched two of the very first initiatives uh, one in the field of uh, native advertising and the other in the field of uh, commerce space and these two we absolutely believe are the uh, are the spaces that are not being watched by these these biggies so and that keeps us energized and i'm sure if we can communicate it well that keeps the team energized as well So Ruth, now it's not like you have small competition here at all by any stretch and and I actually want to want you to expand a little bit on it to also talk about the idea that look it's a great time to be a customer in India. I mean between the deals that you're offering, the deals that other people are offering, it's just couldn't be better. So as you deal with this competition, as you deal with these people and as you have to keep your staff energized, you talk a little bit about how you look at acquiring the customer and keeping the customer in the context of all the the money coming after me. Sure. So you know I think I have a I have a little more to add uh, in addition to what Abhay said about competition. You know, we at some level as a company feel blessed uh, because our company is strongly powered by technology, but has a very very strong offline ground presence as well, uh, which you know is a big differentiator for us. And we've had some experience in the past. you know given the given the many businesses that we've been in uh, as a part of one journey we've had some experience with in dealing with global competition where you know earlier in the days about 4 years back when we were running our local deals business for the longest time you know american companies used to have one deal in a in a day in a city uh which made sense for the us because you know us cities are relatively small in size there's just one downtown everyone goes there for shopping etc 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 just didn't make sense in india if you talk about a city like delhi it has probably 30 downtowns and no one's no one's traveling all the way from north delhi to noida to get a discount on a haircut <laughs> <laughs> and you know for the longest time when when global companies come into india or you know when there were so many other competitors in the market people used to believe that there is a playbook and you just need to follow the playbook as is when we talk to our customers people told us as is you know today's deal is in noida do you expect me to go from drive 50 kilometers to noida to save 100 bucks on a haircut no and that's when we launched uh, uh deals which are closer to consumers so we split cities into 10 20 different parts and that became one of our biggest differentiations and reasons for growth that's just one example of how localization is so important same applies to the current business which we are in there are so many different ways in which we touch consumers lives for example the concept of cash on delivery doesn't exist in a large part of the developed developed economy and this is such a big differentiation for the country uh so making sure we sort of stay keep our keep our ears on the ground and keep really keep innovating for the country rather than being stuck to that you know here is the global playbook this is what happened and we just need to copy that so then but as a customer i'm getting great deals absolutely and so are you am i going to continue to get great deals am i going to stay loyal to one platform am i Can you keep moving because of the next great deal somewhere else? How do I you think, think about it? I think you you will absolutely continue to keep getting great deals. Uh, the big reason for that is because of the business that we are in. Uh, you know, for the longest time, because offline retail hasn't organized offline retail hasn't scaled in the country. There's a big big distribution issue. Uh, suppliers do not get access, or because there is no big organized retail. As a supplier or a manufacturer, I can't I can't go to one retailer and get nationwide distribution. uh and as a customer that creates so many people in between 
till the time I get my final product. So 20 different markups are applied to that. We are just helping leveling that playing field. Making the world a better place. Absolutely. It, making the country a better place <laughs> for now. So, Abhay, data, uh, discipline, and intuition. These are three kind of elements that come together as entrepreneurs build their businesses. And at times, they seem at odd with each other. And, you know, innovation or intuition is, is about, okay, I feel it. I know I want to go build a native ad platform. I want to get into e-commerce for the business. The data doesn't exist yet. How do you think, I want to go global, the, the, the zero one uh, decisions. How, how, how do you think um, you reconcile that as you continue to build the business and as you continue to try to move in those, take those major steps in a company? So I think uh, only thing which is true between uh, these three is in some sense intuition. And I've come to believe with that over the period of time that somehow that little voice inside your heart is almost always correct. Over the period of years, we train our mind to suppress that voice. And uh, that is probably the, the worst thing that we could do. Uh, in fact, one of the decisions for me to take over HR, we just took over HR about three months ago. And it's also a decision driven out of intuition. I, I know nothing about HR. Uh, I think I have a fundamental belief that entrepreneurs are born HR heads. And that's what uh, we're doing. So I at least believe that uh, data will be at odd with intuition almost always. Uh, you need to start listening to that little voice inside your heart because that is going to give you, and then find ways to justify that uh, through other means and not the other ways because that's not how you started a zero to one. That's not why you started the business. It was that little voice that gave you the, 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 the route to start and that's the one which is going to take you there. So. It sounds like you guys have had many little voices over the years <laughs> telling you to change. You know, uh, I think uh, our experience in running our present business has taught us uh, and our entire organization to be uh, extremely evolution friendly uh, and experimental in nature. Uh, we always remind ourselves uh, that even Snapdeal.com, when it started, uh, was, a, was really a four people skunk works experiment in a 20 people company. Uh, and had that skunk works experiment not happened, we wouldn't be we wouldn't be sitting here or running the company that we are running. So it's always important for us to, and our entire company knows that. So we always keep reminding ourselves every single day of how Snapdeal.com started, and as a result, any anything that we feel valuable, uh, we almost consider it our responsibility to experiment it and see if it's working out. Great. Well, guys, listen, thank you, and congratulations on all of the success. I, uh, I think that's it for the panel here, and um, I'll turn it back over. Thank, thank you, Sadeep. Thanks, Rohit. Thanks, Sadeep.